Well, welcome. Um, I know that I'm the talk before lunch, which is actually, it takes all the pressure off because, I mean, honestly, we could, we could stop right now and just act like we had a, had a talk and we could beat everybody to the buffet line. So we take a quick vote or maybe I'll just move quick. That's fine. So, well, good. Well, um, yeah, we're going to talk about best practices for outsourcing. So this is a great crowd. And if you guys don't mind, I want to fire off a few just kind of rapid fire questions to understand kind of context who I'm talking to. Um, who has ever outsourced a project? Okay. Or a piece or a piece of a project's fine. Okay, good. So who had an outsourced project that went well? Good experience, okay. Who had an outsourced project that was a nightmare? All right, it's understandable. And who hears the word outsource and it's kind of like a, like a swear word? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Please don't leave. Cause you I had my hair in accident, I'm just too lazy. <laughs> okay, okay. You'll make it more fun anyways, so that's good. We'll do a little mini debate or something. That'd be fun. Well, good. Well, that's perfect context. I think we'll have uh, a, lot, a lot to talk about, some good value to add, hopefully that you'll take away, some solid stuff. So we'll start pretty, pretty high level. So if you've, I know everybody, this is the second day of the conference, using your brain a lot. You can kind of check out a little bit for this one. This will be pretty high level business context. Um, and we'll talk about the types of outsourcing. We'll go through that a little bit. Um, how to find the right outsource partner. So I definitely want to cover that as well. And then we'll talk about um, really what, what the core of the talk is and its um, best practices for how to outsource well um, once, you, once you decide to take that plunge. Let's see. There we go. So my context, I work for a company called IT Hands. And the company's been around since 2001. And um, I've heard this a couple times the last couple of days. And I'm okay with it, but 2001, I was in elementary school. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I guess it's not offensive to ask somebody how old they are when they look like they're 15. But um, so 2001, I was not with IT Hands. Um, but 17 years in this business is um, a long time. So we've seen a lot. We've seen a lot of industry change. Um, and that's really where we've gathered a lot of the expert knowledge that we have around the idea of outsourcing. Um, and I'll talk about this a little more, but we're really not even talking about just offshoring. And you'll see that we have um, over 100 employees. I think the last I heard, we have 106 teammates, my colleagues, that work for us based out of India. And the story behind that was we had two American guys that moved to India in 2001 to start our team. And they still live there and manage our team. And there's five total Americans and their families that live there full time now. So I'm based in Atlanta, travel often to India, um, travel all over the states. And then we have one other full time um, salesperson, which, which is what I am, out of uh, Denver as well. And really what we do is we're an outsource partner for agencies and for web companies. So, um, you know, just like I started the conversation with, you know, who's had a bad experience? Who's had a good experience? Usually every conversation I have with an owner starts there. It's like a therapy session, you know? They're like getting it off their chest. They're like, look, I just want you to know, I get 100 emails from people like you a day, and I've had 10 projects that have been totally derailed. And I mean, I get it. I've just heard it enough now, and I see where it could be possible. Hence why I think there's some solid best practices that can make it a little easier. So this is a picture of our team. Um, this was from January when I was there. So I'm down there on the bottom right. If you can see, we're kind of all scattered in. This is most of our team at a development day that we do really monthly. Um, obviously, I'm not always there. Um, so yeah, just a great, great crew there. And um, they're based in North India, so north of Delhi. And then give you a little more of a visual. This is our office. Funny story, um, the building that we just purchased, and we have two offices there, and one of the buildings that we purchased, um, the guy before us modeled it after the White House. So I don't, have an, I don't have an outside picture. I should have included one, but it looks like the White House of India. It's, it's pretty, pretty funny. And there's, uh, when you're walking in there, and then the uh, obligatory ping pong table. Um, I thought I was pretty good. 
you, you cannot call it ping pong there, it's table tennis. Thought I was pretty good at table tennis until I showed up at our office and uh, it's pretty demoralizing. <laughs> so let's get into more of the meat of the presentation and talk about um, really why we can outsource. So Jocelyn, thanks for coming. Um, I don't know if you guys caught Jocelyn's talk yesterday. Um, she covered so much of why there would be a solid business case for outsourcing. Um, and really the context of her talk was going from you know, the freelance stage to really the agency stage. So we see that a lot. And actually we work with a lot of freelancers. So one person shops that they're okay with being the size that they are. So, and they might even still call themselves an agency, but they're just one person shop. And really everything that they do is outsourcing out to a partner. Um, for today's talk, we're really going to be talking about development and design, because I think that covers most of the people here. So you can outsource anything. I mean, you can outsource virtual assistants. Um, you can outsource financial services. Um, we're just set up for that now. Um, but for today's talk, we'll be talking about um, design and development and how we can do that really well. So some owner goals. I told you a lot of what I do day to day is meeting with owners, owners of agencies and web companies. And you know, I sit down and there's really a trend in what they tell me every time. I mean, I, all over the country, hundreds of, hundreds of companies that we meet with every year and there's kind of the same things over and over. And one of the things I hear a lot is owners want to get to a place and they can work more on their business rather than in their business. Does anybody kind of understand what that means when I say that where, I mean, we've all seen it, right? I mean, it's 11 o'clock at night on, on a Thursday night, you're trying to go to bed, all of a sudden you get pulled into this. I mean, you are the CEO of your business and you're being pulled into you know, tiny little issues um, late at night, right? I would consider that working in the business versus working on the business, right? I mean, just pulled into small tasks and being more in the weeds, I would call it. So um, owners wanna work more on their business rather than in their business. They want to take on more projects, but they don't necessarily want to run out and hire tons of people to be full time and to help them do it in house. Um, they're under your roof. There's a lot of cost that comes under or that comes from that. Not just their hourly rate, not just their salary, um, but there's tons of other costs that would be associated with that, like equipment. I know Jocelyn, you covered some of this yesterday as well. Equipment, um, even all the way to you think about HR and the time that it takes and the investment that it takes to deal with that. Um, you know, hiring full-time people, but you want to keep growing. You want to grow your business, right? And then increase technical skill set. That can happen really, really quick. I know we're all WordPress people here, right? Um, but you get this, you know, dream project that um, is either a a little more complex in WordPress than you're used to dealing with, or it's in a totally different technology. You can immediately find a team. And then focus on your strengths. I love this. I mean, you go into your business, you're excited about doing it, and then you realize there's like maybe only like four or five things about running your own business that you actually love to do and that you thrive on. Not to mention from a total business perspective where, or the whole business perspective where your business has strengths and then you try to do it all and you immediately, those strengths start getting pulled all over the place and you have to refocus and go back to your strengths and know what you do well. And then running a lean business model. I know this is, this is pretty trendy now, but I totally believe in it. Um, and just operating on lean, lean overhead. Take some pressure off. Any questions so far? Any thoughts? I know this is a lot of just lead in, setting, setting the stage. So let's talk about options for outsourcing. So. For today, we're really just talking about two, and you guys have heard these terms, onshore versus offshore. So um, a few just options to throw out for, for onshore are platforms like Upwork and Codable. Um, there's other ones, other ones as well, but those are the, the first two that I think of and the ones I hear most often in the industry. Familiar with those, anybody? So this is essentially an online marketplace for developers, designers, um, I mean, pretty much anyone. And it, um, and I'm, again, I'm speaking specifically for the development desi design space, but there's even outside the industry, if you need work done around your house, there's other platforms that are similar to this. 
Um, so Upwork and Codable are ones that I hear quite often. Um, they have slightly different standards for vetting, and I know that this is changing often. So a lot of times what you'll see is a, a profile, right? So an initial profile with a rating. I'll show you a screenshot in just a second. Um, a profile with a rating, um, a history of the types of projects they've done and how well they've gone with the reviews. Um, but I, from my understanding, Codable has a slightly different vetting process that might be a little more in-depth, um, you know, most of their most of their developers that are on the on the platform are highly highly rated, um, but I think there's a bit of a cost differential there. Anybody anybody speak to that? Okay. Well, look, Codable is a little more expensive typically, right? And then local freelancers and contractors. I think this one is um, incredibly exciting. Really, the next two, specifically within the WordPress community. So you think about you have a need. You want to outsource that need to somebody else, the first place you go to maybe is the WordPress community. And somebody that you know from your meetup or somebody that you meet here at WordCamp. Um, and that could be a local freelancer or contractor, um, or it could be one agency to another agency. There's just, there's enough business to go around. We don't have to be so stingy. We do have to set high standards, but there's enough business to go around to partner with your competition in certain instances. And I've seen it time and time again. And I'll give you one example. Um, this, is, this is not necessarily um, development, well, it's, it's design related, it's not development related. But just a food for thought. So IT Hands, um, we actually went through a, a kind of a rebranding, we're going through it now, a rebranding and a redesign of our, our website. So, Theoretically, we should totally be able to redesign our own website. We have design, I mean, that's right. I mean, um, but what happens? I'm sure everybody in this room can identify with this. The first thing that gets pushed down the list when anything client related comes up is your own website, right? What's the, what's the quote about the shoes and the cobbler? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, yep, exactly. Yep, there you go. So that was what was going on with us, right? And it was never a priority, and it always got pushed down. And so we decided to make a little RFP and send it out to some of our clients who are agencies, are web companies. And so they did the branding, and the messaging, and then the redesign of the site. And so I say that to give you an example, because here, here are the things that we learned. We learned a ton in the sales process, <coughs> kind of being on the other side of that coin just to send out an RFP, um, have some people come back and respond, look at somebody else's sales process, and we, we were amazed. So I think we sent it out to maybe six or seven of our clients. We got back two proposals, two. And then I think one of the proposals we actually had to follow up on. So, I mean, the project was there, it was teed up, it was ready, um, but the agencies weren't. So that could have been they were swamped, that could have been I don't know, they might just not wanted to do it, I don't know, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think it's just a reflection of, um, you know, workload and distraction. So in yes, sir? Practices, how do you avoid a situation like that? In, in what way? Not responding to a proposal that came, came in? How do you filter out the folks that are non-responsive? On the front. Yeah. Without wasting all the time of going through, giving them the RFP, trying to wrangle a bid out of them. Right. How do you use your best practices to avoid that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you. I mean, from our perspective, us being the client in that scenario, we didn't do much wrangling. I mean, it was like, if you don't how want it. Do you, how do you avoid that kind of problem on the front end? Well, I mean, there was nothing we could do to avoid it. I mean, we, we teed it up for them, and then there were just certain people that didn't respond. And so I think it really, I don't know, it was a reflection on the ones that did, um, on the type of work product they were ultimately going to give us. So, and it, and, and it was role reversal there, right? I mean, usually we're the one that is putting out the proposal. So it was role reversal for us. And so that's, honestly, I say that as a, as a learning opportunity. Um, so much so, and we learned a couple other things too, just about process, how we walk through proposals, um, to outsource something, maybe once a year, doesn't have to be the biggest thing, but just something.
to get to know the industry, to understand other people's sales process was very, very helpful for us. So I think we'll continue to do it. So let's go back. Um, so we talked about some onshore options. Offshore options, Upwork and Codable are also great platforms for this. Um, and then just cross-cultural teams. So there's teams all over the world in different structures um, that could absolutely be an outsourcing option for you. And I'll, I'll talk about kind of the structure of those really quickly. So, um, you know, one structure could be that the team is 100% based in another country. Um, they don't have any U.S. representation. There could be another structure uh, we see like ours where maybe um, I think the difference would be that there is representation here in the States, but that representation is communicating with somebody else offshore. So they're kind of the expert in handling that scenario. Maybe the person in the States is the project manager, and then they're just communicating with a larger development team or design team in another country. And then we're seeing more and more people that um, are moving into more of a model like ours. We actually have um, American representation that lives in the country where um, the rest of, you know, the colleagues are, or, or the teammates are. Um, so it, we see it a lot in India. I think um, some things are trending more towards South America. And so I think, you know, maybe for a lot of people who have never really left the country all that much, and they like the idea of maybe living overseas or something like that, maybe South America is an easier transition. So we're seeing it in different places. Um, but there are different models for working with cross-cultural teams is really the point that I want to make. And one other one that I think is interesting that we might start seeing more of as well, and I see it more with bigger agencies, is an agency will actually go and start their own team. So in a way that's not even outsourcing, it's just that they have maybe another office in another country, and that's where all the development design is done or something like that. So it's still cost effective in a lot of ways, but it's actually their team that, that's set up in another country. So why would you want to keep something onshore versus offshore? I promise, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic when it comes to this, right? I believe in the concept of outsourcing, um, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily pushing one way or the other on onshore. I'm pushing for what works for you, right? And so let's think about a couple of reasons why it might be better to onshore. So, um, you know, the first thing, it's easier to meet in person. We live in a super tech heavy world. All of us love tech. The first thing probably that we're going to think about when we need something now is we're going to go Google it and we're going to find a platform like Upwork and Codable and that's like our inclination now. It's amazing. Um, but I would say a best practice is to still meet them in person. Don't lose the human element, you know, in a tech heavy world. It's, uh, I mean, you're essentially hiring somebody to be an extension of your team, which is the goal. So I think in most cases, you'd want to meet anybody that was going to be full time under your roof. You'd want to meet them in person. I'd say do the same thing with anybody that you're going to hire onshore just because it's easier. Even if they're in another state, invest the money, travel to go see them, invest the money, you know, buy them a flight to come see you. Um, it's totally worth it. Build a personal relationship. So I know a lot of times we walk into these scenarios and we, we just need the work done. I get it. But ideally, you're not going to want to go out and find a new outsource partner every time you just need a project done. So build a relationship. Get to know them. Again, treat them like an extension of your team. That's the goal. Maybe it's not the case in the first couple of projects, but that's what you're working towards. Obviously, a same and similar time zone. I think a lot of the stress that I hear about and a lot of the, the you know, breakdown of communication and all that stuff, it just, it, it's just a grind for people to deal with a different time zone a lot of times. So, for example, my, my day to day, um, my day starts pretty early. I mean, if I wanted to get up at four o'clock in the morning and start talking to my team, three o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter. They're up and they're available. I mean, it's getting, it's getting to the afternoon in India at that time. So for us, all the communication with clients happens in the morning. If you're not a morning person, maybe not a good idea to, to work with an Asian team. And then one other that I think is interesting is the, um, I added the word perception of greater control. So maybe one reason that you would choose to work onshore versus offshore is really having the feeling that if worse came to worst, you could hop on a flight, 
fly to Oklahoma and see your developer and, real, and, and figure out what's going on, right? And, and do that over the course of, you know, 24 hours. Not so easy to shoot over to India, uh, you know, from one day to the next. So there, there's a perception of greater control and understanding, I think, with onshore versus offshore. And I don't think we should shy away from that. I think it's fine, if that's important. So I mentioned the screenshot about um, Upwork. For anybody who hasn't seen it, this is really what it looks like. It, I guess I should ask, Rodney or Scott, they're not, not in the room today? <laughs> so I think we're safe. And if you know them, just tell them I talked really nicely about them. But um, so yeah, so these, these are two onshore options for um, specific WordPress work. So <laughs> even, uh, I posted this the other day and um, you know, the WordPress experts were, were nitpicking every piece of it, um, even kind of the you know, miscapitalization of WordPress and WooCommerce and <laughs> I mean, it's just, um, yeah, you, you could do that for a couple minutes there. Uh, <laughs> but that's also really important stuff. I, I'm kind of a high level guy but I hang around with developers who are incredibly, incredibly detail oriented and it's important, right? And so even if I was looking at something like this, I'd be like, man, uh, it's not quite as clean as I would expect if somebody's making their livelihood off of freelancing through Upwork. So I'd probably keep scrolling down the page or I'd look for another option. Also, you'll notice um, their hourly rate. So Almost $70 an hour, $55 an hour. That's uh, probably pretty normal, I would think, across the country, based off what I see for onshore, um, by the hour help. Um, so that'll give you, you know, a general idea of what that might cost. So again, let's think about how we could pick the right offshore team. Highly suggest meeting in person. Interview them as, af as if they're gonna be a, a full-time resource. So I keep talking about Jocelyn. She gave it just, your talk was great. And um, you know, your, your um, story about vetting and how you created your own test and kind of sent them through that process. I mean, that sounds just like you were gonna hire somebody to work for you full-time. And, and they essentially are, right, in terms of the hours. Um, I mean, that was, that was great. And I would highly suggest that. So, build an interview process and then treat it like you're hiring somebody to actually come in and work side by side with you in your office, even though they're not, they're gonna be remote. Next one's very important as well. Understand your potential partner's workload. So I see this a lot with, with um, freelancers and contractors. So people that are um, you know, taking on a lot of work, doing it on behalf of agencies, they're, they're kind of receiving the outsourced work that they just get a lot on their plate. And so if you're an agency or if, if you're a, even if you're a freelancer contracting out or outsourcing out to another contractor or freelancer, ask the question on the front end. It's totally fair to understand what's on their plate, how much their workload is. And I'll tell you how I see this play out. Time and time again, um, it, it could even be a personal relationship or a friend that one agency outsources to the freelancer they know the deadline on the front end, they commit to it, they say yes, no problem. All of a sudden there's five or six other projects that come in. Potentially, um, maybe you don't know that they're getting a higher hourly rate from somebody else. They're getting paid more from another partner, another agency than what you're paying and all of a sudden your project becomes a little less important than it was when you first talked to them. So this, this happens. I'm not passing judgment, I'm just saying it happens. So. The best practice there would be to just ask and understand how much is on your potential partner's plate so that you don't get to the 11th hour and they're like, hey, uh, by the way, not gonna get this done or even worse, they just totally disappear, which also happens. And then ask for a referral, common sense, right? So go within the WordPress community and figure out somebody who's been in a scenario like you've been in and figure out how they solved it. Figure out um, you know, one, or, one or two good teams that they went to or they go to on a regular basis when they need some help. Um, you know, an event like WordCamp is an amazing place to do that. 
um, for you know development, for design, for maintenance. Um, these are all great scenarios where you can ask around within the WordPress community or within a, you know, a peer group and figure out some good, good teams and partners. So offshore, why would we do that? Why would we offshore versus onshore? Um, number one, I think greater capacity. I mean, we have access to the whole world versus maybe if you have, you know, um, preference to just outsource locally within Atlanta or preference to outsource within the, within the states. Um, you have access to the whole world, so you immediately pick up all this different capacity. Um, you don't sacrifice the vetting, and we'll talk about that more, um, but just immediate capacity, better rates. I think that's pretty true across the board. Um, you're just going to get lower hourly rates in other countries. And I'll, I'll show a map in just a couple seconds. It'll give you an idea of what that looks like as well. I actually like to put a positive spin on this with time zones um, to say you can use it to your advantage. So it's not for everybody, but um, you know, particularly with, with Asian countries, right? So we're going to bed, right? it's the afternoon, they're waking up. So it's important to communicate clearly, right? So set expectations very clear, but if you've got a couple tasks that need to be done, you know it's pretty straightforward, you can send it to them, wake up, the next morning it's done. That's on every team, but I would say in a good relationship, that's great. I use that internally all the time. I mean, I'm constantly like, you know, I tell my wife, I'm going to need to do one more thing, one more thing. She doesn't understand why that's so important. I'm like, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and, and my team's going to be back to me with whatever I, you know, needed or whatever I asked for. Um, and so it just works well. But there is a flow. There is a process. It takes time. I didn't learn that overnight. It just takes a little bit of time. So, um, but it's absolutely something you can use to your advantage. And this cross-cultural experience, I really appreciate this as well, just getting to know another culture. I've, I've come to just love Indian culture. I had zero context of it before, before I joined IT Hands, zero. Um, and I've come to love Indian culture, and I've had the opportunity to experience lots of other cultures in that process as well. So like I said, it's not always easy to get to India, so I usually make it a point to stop over somewhere else and check it out there too. Um, so it's uh, just, it really a, a solid experience um, if, if that's what you're looking for and if that's important to you. So picking the right offshore team, once again, ask within your network, common sense, don't skip it though, it's important. Find somebody that's had a good experience. Find a process driven team. I love this and I've seen it be incredibly, incredibly crucial to the success of projects. So if you're vetting teams and going, you know, going through that whole process and you're the one that's driving that process, your team's not driving it at all, that's a, that's a red flag. So you want to find a team that's process driven because that's going to keep things moving, you know, moving um, well. And then choose a time zone and a rate that fits. What I would encourage is don't go into a situation based on price but you're ultimately bitter about the minor inconveniences or major inconveniences that you're having to face because of you know, the lower cost. Just don't do it. Maybe, it. maybe there's another option out there that would fit you. Um, like I said, if you're a morning person, um, you're gonna have to adjust a little bit to working with an Asian team that is structured like ours, right? Where we, we really don't work American hours. We work adjusted hours, but they're not American hours. And so, um, our clients have to be okay with, with meeting in the mornings. And we really have a tough time working with clients on the West Coast because there's like an hour that we have with them. And so um, take all that into account when you're picking a team. And then travel. I wouldn't encourage to do this on the front end, maybe. Uh, I'd get a couple, maybe a couple projects under your belt. And, uh, but say, for example, you do find a team that you've sent a couple projects to, it's going well, go on a little, uh, go on a little work trip and go see them. Put a question on the time zone. Yes, sir. Isn't the Americans who have to work at night, why do not the offshore teams have people that work our time zone? There, there are. There are teams that will do that. You know, I've had problems the way they specifically said, oh, we know the link to us. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, so our, our take on that 
Um, it's, it's just really important for us to treat our employees really well that live there. Not saying that any employees that are working a night shift, they're treated poorly, but for us, we have to draw a line in the sand is we really want our team to go home and spend time with their family. And you know, a lot of times they are on meetings at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night because, because they need to be to serve our clients really well. Um, but we, we have just drawn a line in the sand to say, hey, we're not gonna be the team that does that. But there are tons of teams that work American hours. So. I have a point to where we do the same model from India. We need to understand that development work is something not a data entry or a monotonous job. It is something that requires fresh mind, logical thinking. So the body cycle, when you, when you are awake in the night, your mind would not be that fresh, would not be that energetic and active as it would be in the daytime. So at least for development tasks, I'm not talking about the support or mm -hmm. kind of tasks. It do not require too much of mindfulness, too much, too much logical thinking. Yeah. In that case, for specialty development stuff, I would encourage to have that in the daytime. We have been, uh, like if we have clients asking us that being available, yeah, we are available for conversation. Mm -hmm. Overlap is there that two to three to four hours. That we sure. Conversate, let's communicate. As Dave rightly said, that uh, uh, communicate a lot so you have clarity about the expectations. But when it comes to working, I mean, let developers choose the right time so they deliver the right product the very first time. Yeah. And if it is a support task that, hey, this is so and so calling here, then yeah, it's, it's fine. I mean, it would not require that much of logical thinking. Sure. That's what yeah. my experience is. It's a great point. Absolutely. Good. So here's a, here's a breakdown. Now this, these are rough numbers, of course. There's exceptions to everything, but here's just a general, very general idea of what, of what you can expect to see um, in different parts of the world. So obviously Latin America, a little bit higher, I think primarily due to the similarity in time zones with the states. Um, not to mention they're just, it's becoming more of a, a technical expertise um, you know, in South America. Europe, obviously a little bit of a time difference there, eight-ish hours and higher rates. Probably, uh, you know, in some of those countries, maybe a little less cultural barrier as well. And then Asia, the biggest time difference, um, you know, $10. I would uh, caution you, much lower than 10. I have worked with people in the Philippines for as much as half of the time. Yeah. Good people. Oh yeah. No, I heard. Uh, I, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. I heard three dollars the other day. Yeah. It was the low. Available. It was the lowest. And um, well, and, and my question is like, is that a good relationship? Is like, are you getting a quality work product? Are things going well? If the answer is yes, like, man, you hit a home run. <laughs> pay them. Pay them five dollars. <laughs> wages across different countries to outsource to, the Philippines is by far and away the least expensive um, and the least cost of living. Sure. So the dollars you pay go as far or farther than anywhere else at the prices you've got up there. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, mention the caveat. There's absolutely exceptions. These aren't, these aren't hard and fast numbers. These are just to give a general idea. Um, obviously, you can pay less than 10. And I would, I would caution you with any outsource scenario to go through the proper vetting process, which let's, let's get to it. Let's not, uh, let's not get too, um, too close to time before we get to those uh, best practices. But I wanted to share this one, one quote here that I heard from an agency the other day, it's a, a local agency, Atlanta agency, somebody I know pretty well, and I was just brainstorming with him, asking him some questions and picking his brain, and this was his quote, I couldn't care less where the location is, um, this is in terms of getting, getting something done, I care about speed, accuracy, communication, and attention to detail. So, I heard that, and I, I don't know, I guess at first it struck me the wrong way, and then I started asking other agency owners, how they felt, and I got a resounding agreement on this. Once again, I, d I don't think that everybody's gonna agree with this, it's fine, um, but I think it covers a, a large base 
Um, so best practices, uh, let's talk about them. Let's just kind of rapid fire through these and hopefully there's some good, good questions and thoughts that come out of them. So let's talk about what it looks like to vet your potential partner. So we talked about meeting with them. I'd, I would make it a requirement, um, obviously to meet. I wouldn't do the whole transaction just um, you know, via email or, or via some online platform. I would actually at least um, set up a call, um, a Zoom call or, or something. And then if you can meet with them in person, great. Ask for references, and the key here is actually to follow up on them, actually to call them and figure out what's going on. I, I'm guilty of that. I've done it too many times where it's like, you know, it's the businessy thing that we're supposed to ask, right? Ask for references, but you don't actually follow up on them. So you lose, you lose the value in it when you don't actually call. Ask for a portfolio, but then once again, dig a little deeper, ask questions about the portfolio, ask what they did. Um, we talked about doing just pieces of projects versus a whole project. So the team might have um, done the design and not built it out. They might, um, in, a, in a lot of ways, because really in a portfolio, all you're going to see is the design. They might have just built it and somebody else designed it, but your perception is based off the front end that you see. Um, so ask some questions, dig around a little bit in the portfolio. Start with a small project. So this is obviously after the place where you've committed to the team, but don't give them your biggest and you know, most crucial project as a first project to start out with. Start with something small, if at all possible. I understand there's situations where you have to find somebody quick and figure that out, but if you can, start small. And then I, um, I know that we're a little short on time, so if maybe a couple people want to throw out some ideas of Word, WordPress specific <coughs> vetting um, that's really unique to expert WordPress development. Anybody have ideas on that or thoughts, maybe one or two? Increasing page speed. So how, how would you, like vetting a partner? Figuring, I yeah. Maybe how, um, how they went about that, what reports they used, yep. um, what their process was, you know, how they price. That's great. Good. But we use quite a bit of different things so you can really see. We've been out for support for a number of years, so mm -hmm. we have a little bit of a process for it. Um, but we found one of the most effective ways is just to pay for a test project. Yep. I mean, you know, there you go. Everybody does WordPress. Uh, everybody, like on your red flags, never hearing no, that always comes up. Yep. Can you do this? Yes. Can you do this? Yes. Can you stand on the boat? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I caught you. You just go to a test project because it, it, once you get into the back end, especially if you have a current system, then you get an idea of if, if they can at least understand where you want them to go. So we right. We do a test project. They didn't do it completely what we wanted, but that's why it was a test project. We weren't waiting on the project. How fast are they going to turn it around? And then it gave us some ideas if they could understand what we need them to do. Right. Yeah. Great point. Yep, totally. Yep, that's what we talked about yesterday. Jocelyn, that's great. Thank you. Good, so a couple red flags you want to look out for. Timeliness. So if that interaction is just, if it's slow, if nothing is happening quickly, if nothing feels like they're moving along, if they don't seem eager to take on your work, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't plan on that getting too much better once the project starts. I get it, where people are busy. I know the expectation is set a little too high now for response time. <laughs> And you know we're always attached to these phones and all that stuff, right? But just in general, you want somebody to kind of be on top of it. Lack of process, we've already talked about that. Um, you know, if they're the ones that are driving the process, or excuse me, if you're the one that's driving the process and you don't feel like there's any process on the other side, absolutely a red flag. A general lack of professionalism, I think we can settle pretty quickly, especially in this, you know, in this space. Um, it is not, not worth it. There's enough good talent, there's enough good talent across the world that will operate in a professional way, that will be a great representative of your business, that it's not worth taking somebody that just doesn't show professionalism in the way that they interact. Is there ultimately, they're a reflection of you. And then never hearing no, this one's, this one's funny, but I mean, if, if every question you ask, they're like, absolutely, I can do it. Yep, no problem, yep, we can do it. Can you do Drupal, WordPress, Joomla? Custom, I mean, just like, you know, you just start naming everything, like, yes, 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 yes. Um, I don't know, maybe there's a super team, but we talked about this. I, I, would, I would doubt it. You know, everybody has their strengths. So if they're not hearing no, let's, uh, let's ask them if they can land on the moon. And then maybe that's your gauge. Communication, 
Transparency, incredibly important. I don't say it in the sense of um, honesty. I say it in the sense of documentation, um, sharing code. Obviously, you know, you should be able to log into your WordPress site at any point and know exactly what's going on. The same as your outsource team. Um, you know, if it's something a little more in depth, having something like GitHub or GitLab, all the code should be stored there, and you should be able to go in at any point and see that. Um, another thing is obviously the timesheet. So if you choose to use a software, um, you know, a time tracking software or just a timesheet, that should be um, up to date at least at least for the week. I mean, a lot of times our, our standard is updating that once a week, but if your expectation is for that to be updated once a day, um, that's fine. Just set the expectation. Uh, but don't be frustrated later on in the project when the team is not doing that every single day and you never told them to. Uh, that's something you kind of need to set on the front end before the project starts. Having weekly meetings, this has been a, a great best practice for us. and I think it shocks agencies a lot of times where we're the one that's driving that. And we actually consider it a requirement that it's not the agency being our client in that process that's setting the requirement. But um, make sure that you have weekly meetings with your outsource partner. And they should be able to answer three questions every single time for you. It's what they did last week on the project, what they're doing right now, and what the plan is for next week. So if that's all you cover and nothing else in a weekly meeting, you're gonna be on the same page for the most part. There shouldn't be any major questions at least. And then obviously building in room for other more specific questions in that process. And then communication tools. I, the important thing about this is that the communication tools are defined on the front end of the project. So don't try to figure this out as you go along. Have an hour long startup meeting. This is what we do. Have an hour long startup meeting before the project starts and define all the communication tools that you're gonna use. Define when you're gonna meet weekly. Just make sure all that is documented prior to the project start. Our preference for communication within projects is, you know, the project management system seems to be the best way. Um, and there's, there's tons of them out there. Um, we use a lot of them, and I don't, I don't necessarily even know that we have a favorite, but um, I think our preference is to use something. And then if there's just nothing, and your client doesn't want to do it, you don't want to do it, um, just create some really solid Google Docs to help guide you through the process. And then build relationships. So plan some get to know you meetings. These are tough. They're gonna fall easily off the priority list, but I'm saying, you know, make it a priority. Um, if you've got a team that you're working with in India, plan 30 minutes and just ask them about, you know, an awesome Indian holiday. Ask them about Holi, ask them about Diwali. You know, something you don't know anything about, but they would love to tell you about it. And you're ultimately gonna have fun doing it. Um, and you're just gonna get to know them a little bit better. But I would say even for, for onshore as well, if you can get together for drinks, if you can get together for lunch, um, do it. Consider them to be an extension of your team and work towards a trusting relationship. So I know we all go into these scenarios with our guard up, as we probably should, but let's keep it as a goal that we're working to build trust on both sides and we're working to a place where they can truly be an extension of you. And then back to offshore, it's pretty exciting to learn about these other cultures and it will be incredibly helpful for you and projects to know about other cultures, particularly, um, you know, obviously my context is India. There's tons of holidays in India. So it's, you know, how that affects your business is maybe it wasn't communicated to you that the team's gonna be out for three days in the middle of October. You're like, what is going on? But you realize all of India is basically shut down for three days in the middle of October, um, you know, if you knew a little bit more about the culture. So I think that's really helpful. Question? Yeah. But um, how do you transition, or is there a line or transition where you officially offer them to be a part of your agency or to come on board? Is there something, is there a shift or something specific that needs to happen? Or is it that I just continue to use them and there's no difference? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't think there's any, I've seen, I've seen lots of different scenarios. I think it's usually just a, a consistency about using the person. I think maybe the thing that could be a formal change is the way that you structure payment 
or structure the amount of hours that you know you're using them for like we'll we'll have an example where or a scenario where we'll do more of like a full-time equivalent type type scenario where you know the team that's assigned on a project is a little more readily available versus if it was just like you know here's a project two months later here's another project we can't guarantee that readiness but I don't other than that other than kind of the way you structure the deal formally I don't know that there's any particular line Yeah, that's a great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So remember that we're we're working we're the outsource. I guess it'd be outsource C, right? We're receiving the outsource projects a lot of times for agencies. Um, we we actually don't let um, any agency that we work for put us on their site. So. Right. So like if, you, like if you were hiring someone to do a project, at what point would you put them on your site? Um, we, we don't see it very often. I'm not sure that I would encourage it, but I, I do see it some where maybe you've got one person that um, it's kind of your go-to freelance partner and maybe they have their own freelance business, but you really do consider them to be a part of your team. Maybe that's a scenario, but like our team, we actually, we actually won't, won't do that. Mm -hmm. Some writers I would own the content, and then for some writers who want you know, that visibility, I actually get on the bottom. Great point. And I, I, of course, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you legal advice here, right? And but it's not legal either. Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. But I would say um, just to give you an um, idea of, of how we handle those scenarios, NDA every every single time. Okay. Um, um, Yeah, it gets tough. There's a podcast right now that NPR just put out about this. Yeah, it gets tough, right? But I, I think it's still a good hoop to jump through. Um, master services agreement. So these are probably documents that you're putting in place with your end client anyways, but um, I would do another one with your outsource partner. And then a um, we call it a work statement. So it's, it's really um, kind of, it's almost a loose, a loose um, scope a agreement. So there's, you know, obviously a lot of scope. You don't know until you're like into the weeds on the project, but at least a loose idea of functionality and scope that, that we would have signed as well. Great questions. I have a quick question. Sure. Right. Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah, we heard this question come up yesterday. Actually, um, very similar. On the record, what I would say is is talk to your accountant, talk to your bookkeeper, and make sure that that's and your lawyer. Yeah. Just make sure that, that that's done. I think, you know what, that's a, that's a great point. I think a lot of times it's really easy to walk into these relationships because they're so clouded by the fact that we have to get a project done. They don't think about a lot of these scenarios. Um, but maybe what I would suggest just from a high level is to pull back and say, look, uh, I need to approach this just like any other you know, full-time scenario. And so I would just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even give you um, direct advice on that. I would just say that's, I mean, that's a great scenario to talk to, talk to a lawyer and, a, and an accountant. Sure. Do you have another question? Sure. Sure. 
um, having to do with the sort of uh, how you attract them and what you, you can't say it's like control, you will work here in this place. It's Right. If you're directing, how you're there are like them. five criteria, yeah. and I think one of them is directed for the work at the end. It's hard to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, an area to be careful. And it's like a tax thing, like it, it depends on how long, you know, like if you give them hours and certain sort of things, but if they're if it's an independent contractor, if it's a six year long independent contractor, mm -hmm. there's nothing that you can do. Sure. That they can do, they have their own EIN or a tax ID number of which they file the income they made from you, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the, they wouldn't have recourse to say, um, I've been working for you, you owe me benefits. Sure. Right. Question? Um, what's the best way to pay people who are in India or wherever? And uh, that are only like, you throw them 10 hours, one month, and even then, like, just sort of project -y. Yeah. So, so, um, the way we do it is a time and materials basis. So we drive, you know, the billable hours, log that for our clients, and then we actually send an invoice just through QuickBooks. Um, but I mean, like, actually pay them. Like, how do you, like, is it, because I think you said PayPal yesterday. Oh, okay. Like, is, is, how do you get the money there? Yeah, so our, ours would be through QuickBooks. So there's, I mean, you can obviously do, like, you know, ACH, you can do credit card, you can do any of that stuff. I would, I would recommend, obviously, just a secure online platform, yeah, I guess. what they prefer, usually, yeah. like. You know, right, yeah. Sure. Most of the Philippines request that you use PayPal. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Um, that's what I do. Right. I was just going to comment about his question very early on about the, um, the RFP and just share an agency's perspective. Typically, agencies, and as you move into being more successful, we tend to ignore RFPs because we tend to sort of be like, look, if I'm one of 20, I, I don't have time for that. Either. Sure. So my recommendation as another, who's busy? Oh, another way, um, a company would respond to it would be instead, instead of sending it to your seven customers, I would instead encourage you to say, okay, I'm going to research. It's like if you're looking for that top agency, mm -hmm. I, it's kind of like, the, you know, the, the who's the prize may have shifted a little bit. Right. And instead, directly approach those top three agencies and seek out probably would have gotten a better response from yeah. the ones you wanted to work with. Sure. Because most of us tend to ignore our face. You know, yeah. So yeah. Well, yeah, no. Somebody who's desperate for work is more to be like, ooh. That's right. Opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, RFP, that, that covers a broad spectrum, right? Like a right. government so RFP so looks. Actual term, you know, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just how you approach it. And I don't know how you actually did it, but I know that's what that word triggered in my head. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, RFP, I immediately think 50 pages of documents that I need to come through that I'm not going to win it. I've got like a, you know, 1% chance, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. All yeah. Else, That's right. Yeah. Yes. Great point. I will say, and you can probably tell this just from me standing in front of you, that ours did not look like that. <laughs> so. Um, but you were saying how it was ignored. So potentially yeah. that was the delivery of three word letters yep. from the subject. That could have been it. Yeah. I don't know. Actually, that's a good point. I'm not even sure at this point. So. Really quick, I know it is lunchtime. You guys are ready to go. Um, two, two books that are really interesting and helpful. Um, the Culture Map, it's a fairly new book and it talks about how to communicate cross-culturally, not just Americans to other countries in the world, um, but other countries in the world between other countries in the world. It is fascinating. So I would highly recommend that um, if you're at all considering working offshore or have worked offshore. And if you're considering working particularly with India, um, this book, Speaking of India, is incredibly helpful, and it was actually written from a context of IT. So um, when we started to see a lot of work um, you know, being moved to India and um, the expertise of India growing and growing, and um, it, this became a major, major, major issue for people all over the world on how to communicate really well um, in an Indian context, and then vice versa. So um, two great books here. I would highly recommend them. Um, and just in closing, so another just couple things to take away. Um, do have proper documentation. We talked about NDAs. We talked about um, work statements or proposals. Everybody has different terms for that. We talked about master services agreements all the way to um, documentation in code, documentation in um, project plan. So you can't over document. Obviously, you want that to be shared amongst everybody involved. So you and your outsource partners. 
Um, strong and respectful vetting. Um, I think that's important to, you know, uh, give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, but, you know, make sure that it's strong and, um, you know, it's getting the job done there. And then start with a low impact project, one that's not going to, you know, change the course of your business, even pay for, you know, a test project. I'd say it's a worthwhile investment. Um, don't throw all your eggs into one team's basket. So I would say if you are going down the outsourcing road and you're investing a lot of your projects into this, um, have a couple teams lined up, have a couple potential resources that you could go to, even a team with 100 people. We run low on capacity at times, it happens. Um, and we have to say no to projects. Um, so you know, have a couple teams in line so that you don't have to run out and vet them right at the last minute when you need to get a project done. And then don't give up after the first couple difficulties. Um, when you're dealing onshore, offshore, it doesn't matter. It just takes a little bit to get to know somebody. Um, I would say if it, you, know, you see a trend of, of negative experience, that maybe is a sign that you should try another team. Um, but you know, if you have one or two little hiccups in communication or process or something like that, let's you know, pump the brakes, give it a chance, um, have some good dialogue about that, and then see if we can make it better. So, Anybody have any, any further questions? Sure. Uh, just a comment. Um, my experience in dealing with offshore teams and outsourcing, it also depends on the kind of project. Like if I, I had a plug-in I wanted to develop, something specific I wanted. Right. I got one freelancer to do it, and he ended up moving from Pakistan to Australia. And then he's like, I'm on vacation for a month. But then I chose another team that had a project manager. Mm -hmm. And this project manager would manage the whole process uh, of, of the, the plug-in and then the development, mm -hmm. but also, you know, you want to make sure you can get support right. afterwards, because the plug-in actually broke after mm. some updates, Yep. and I tried to re-engage the original guy, but that's when I found, oh, I'm, I'm not available, I'm, you know, and it's broken. So sure. when I went to this other team, you know, developers don't like to work on other developer yeah. stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So it was real difficult to get a transition to another team, but then the team with the project manager actually communicated with me and we talked and he got his team engaged right. and they documented everything. He said, look, we're spinning up a project for this. We're gonna always have it here. Right. And we're gonna have all the documentation. So if you ever need assistance or support, we'll be able to go back to the project, take a look at what we did, mm -hmm. how we engaged, and be able to, to start up from there. Yeah. So that's important too. So I heard great communication yeah. from your project manager. Yeah. I heard solid documentation. That's right. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then just somebody that will be around. Yep. You know, when you're doing content and stuff like that, you know, you get it one time, or you get somebody to do something on a web page one time, and it's because you don't have time to do it. Right. But if, you're doing, if you have someone doing some kind of code development or developing a specific plugin, you're going to need to, you're going to want that support, right? Because sure. Because if you're putting this on a, a client site or you, if you're having some major website and this thing is going on, you know, you're using outsource, you want to make sure that you, if you do outsource it, that they'll be around and that they can re-engage if need to. If right. If need be. Right. Later time down the road. Great points. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. Yeah, it's a great, thank great you. discussion. Yeah, thank you.